Welcome back, fellow conspiracy realists. Tonight's classic episode takes us to Staffordshire, England, uh, where we are going to learn about, oh, gosh, do you guys remember this one? The Shugborough inscription cipher? Shugborough? Oh, yeah. I re- No, I don't remember. That's where Shug Knight was from. It was named after Shug Knight. That's his childhood home. Mm-hmm. That Shug, borough. Shug borough. Yeah. No, yeah, there's, there's a sculpture out there in England that is a recreation of a painting called Shepherds of Arcadia, but this sculpture has a very bizarre inscription. And this inscription has birthed numerous conspiracy theories, or I guess if we're being a little more diplomatic, numerous fringe interpretations. Love it. Accurate. Let's start transcribe. No, inscribe. I don't know. Let's, let's check it out. Sure. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, mission control deck, and most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. How's, how's everybody feeling? Uh, back for another week. I'm feeling awesome. Can I tell you a quick story? Please, Okay. Yeah. So my son is aware of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. We haven't watched any of the movies yet, but he has a couple of these, uh, the paper or the cardboard books of Star Wars stories, mm-hmm. and he knows what a lightsaber is, and he's real hyped about lightsabers. So Wait, I, Does he say it? Huh? He says lightsaber? Yeah, lightsabers, yeah. He loves it, and he makes the sound. He goes, whoo, 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 whoo. <laughs> That's um, great. Awesome. Well, so uh, I realized that my wife and I had an old stash of glow sticks, because, you know, everybody's just got some glow sticks hanging around that are still packaged from, you know, back in your 20s, right? I mean, live your truth, bro. Cool, yeah. okay. So I realized that we had some. I found a like a green one and a red one. So I get to play Darth Daddy and he gets to, <laughs> and he pretends that uh, he's Yoda, always Yoda. Yeah. And we have lightsaber battles with glow sticks now, almost nightly. You think it's because Yoda is like around his height and he I'm recognizes super that? Super agile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's got to be it. That's got to be it. Mind but, control powers. That's a, <laughs> yes. that's a selling point. Yeah. And he does force tornado on me all the time and it's, it's, Debilitating. It's brutal. Yeah. yeah wait, 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 where is that in the lexicon, though? Force <laughs> tornado. Is that, did he make that up or is that canon? Pretty sure the next episode is going to have a force tornado. Okay. Mm. I mean, you heard it here first. Okay. All right. Well, we look forward to seeing this franchise develop, Matt. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I think the Star Wars thing's going places. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, I my spider sense tells me, how are you doing, Noel? How's it how's how's it going? I'm doing well. Uh speaking of spider sense, mm-hmm. did you guys see uh the end game? The end of the, the end game? I did. I haven't. Okay. okay. No 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 discussion then. No, no. I, I kinda want discussion. Well, I mean, this isn't really the place I can go for this. Save it's, me three hours, please. It's a victory lap. It's it's a but it's a really, really expensive victory lap. And yeah. it's and it, and it and it has some very satisfying conclusions. Sure. Yeah. It has a few things that are kinda like W. ETF, yeah. and it has a few things that are kind of a little bit glossed over and then sort of like, wait, what happened to that thread? They sort of mm-hmm. left it. But Whoa. all in all, what a what a feat. What a yeah. what a treat. What a feat, though. Like, just of organizational <laughs> yes. skills, right? Just to, oh, sure. Just to give all those characters their due. And you know? no one's expecting that Wolverine cameo. That was <laughs> like... That is wild. <laughs> is there ever any point in the movie where all of those A-list like actors are in one place? Totally. Ah, uh, that's it or that's, not? You, like, compl- like you can tell they're not green screened in or whatever. Uh-huh. I can't comment. That's too much, though. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I they're comment. they're the, the Avengers plus all the others. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a payoff people have been waiting for, and I think it's well worth the price of a ticket. You know, that's the kind of film that's good to see in theaters. Good to see on the IMAX if you have that av- ability. Uh, for sure. I I, I, st- I will die on this hill to quote Ben Bolin. <laughs> Screw 3D. Not worth the price. I'd pay that price just to see it on the bigger screen with a better sound system. Did you watch it in 3D? No, I don't. I just I, – I, I, some one time Black Panther I saw in 3D because mm-hmm. someone invited me having already bought the tickets and then popped it on me once I got there that it was 3D. Whoa. And the tickets were like 40 bucks A, B. Wow. Don't like 3D. Yeah. C, it's like it's giving me a headache. <laughs> it wasn't fun. And I had my kid with me, so that was like $80 of movie. Oh. You know, it was – I mean, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but... I don't know, man. Once you yeah. factor in popcorn... I just don't like 3D. I don't find it immersive or fun We're already all. in 3D. You exactly. know what I mean? Like I don't get it. 
album. Yeah, yeah, fully. It's like advertising a movie with sound. <laughs> uh, I I had this. I, I had this. Well, wait, oh, hold on. Yeah. Ben, how are you doing? I, I, you know, I have an interesting story for you about Avengers that has nothing to do with the film, really. I won't spoil anything because I know a lot of us listening feel very strongly about spoilers. I love them. Most people hate them. Anyway, so I'm watching this. I'm watching this thing, and it is a long journey. It's it's a long film, and there are ups and there are downs. And I, I think overall, it's very well made. But there's really there's a really 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 sad part that gets a lot of people. And as I was watching the sad part in the theater, I heard someone uh, kind of <laughs> behind me, and I thought, "Oh, yeah, I guess I guess got a cold or something. You shouldn't really be outside if you're contagious." And then I heard more people like, <laughs> and uh, Did everybody get a hold of some I, like. <laughs> I thought people I, – I was like, wow, it's really going around, you know? Yeah. It's just, and I've never encountered measles in the wild. So I was like, do people have measles or whatever? And then uh, the people I was at the movie with, uh, I, I like – I asked them about it afterwards and they said, no, you – I don't want to use the strong language they used, but they said, no, dude, don't be a robot. They were crying. Yeah. So I think I just am missing that emotional – Switch. Yeah, I would have oh, thought man. your one feeling a year would possibly have fallen on the Avengers. No, I would have put yeah, that bet three. down too. Three, really? is it three, three. three. So yeah, I'm going for one three. of your one of your. Three. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You could have reserved well, for the Avengers because you you <laughs> genuinely did grow up with these characters. That's right. Uh, I, did. Of, I guess we all did. Yeah. Well, yeah, but out of a lot of people that I know, you're probably one of. Yeah, you know the characters in the story. And you know the, the comics, too. You know That's all what the, I'm saying. Yeah, the original lore. You guys know the comics. Not, no, no, not, not to like the degree. You. So many of these characters were not big flagship characters, at least for me. You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, but, but be that as it may, I think we did a really great job talking about the Avengers without giving anything away. Totally. So if, uh, if you haven't seen it yet— uh, do check it out. Yeah. They are not paying us to say this. Mm-hmm. We just think it's so. And Matt, I can't wait till you see it so we can hang out and talk about it. I can't wait to finally see Ant Man get crushed by the boot of some other character. That's actually his nemesis. It's a supervillain called the, the boot. boot. No, it's not. It's a, it's like kind of <laughs> teased. <laughs> I as honestly the next don't story know. Arc. I honestly don't know. Paul Paul is uh, Paul is a huge film buff. Mission Control over here, and uh, he enjoyed the film as well. So if you can't take Nolan and I's cosign as uh, as as worth worth it, yeah, take Paul's. Okay, but, but what about what about Game of Thr- Game of Thrones, yo? Game of Thrones. What about the Game of Thrones? Hey, did you Do-tees. guys did you guys love that cup cameo? Uh, the cup cameo made my day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get it because Cup's story is super complicated in the books, and it's like a pivotal point. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it justice on the screen, you know? Oh, and Tyrion is like giving it the side eye. (laughs) Did you see that they uh, they CGI'd it out, though? That's one of the beautiful things as far as the network's concerned of streaming Mm -hmm. is, you know, if it's printed and it's in the theaters, they're not going to pull all those prints out of every theater in the the country. Mm -hmm. But for this, they just go in there, blip, re-upload. Yep. It's like it was never there, except the internet never forgets. How many people got fired, do you think? Just one, one, uh, one best boy. One, one best boy with the best dream. That's right. So, well, that guy became a legend. Uh, if we, we'll get to the point of the show yeah. in just a second, uh, we you guys owe us a little bit of a rambling intro. I think we've been keeping it pretty tight. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and uh, we want to hear directly from you your opinions about this this intro or your your opinions about uh, any old thing on your mind from previous episodes or suggestions for a future episode. Uh, yeah. Matt, our friend and cohort Matt, has been on this amazing journey listening to voicemails. Yeah, I got to tell you, I haven't, uh, I haven't been off of this journey in a while now. <laughs> Does oh, someone need to take up the mantle, Matt? It's so great. It's such a roller coaster because it gets really dark sometimes, mm-hmm. and then it is the funniest thing I've heard all week sometimes, mm-hmm. and then it just happens again. Uh, but the best thing is that... Everything that gets put on that the voicemail message machine is genuine and awesome. And everyone, every if you're hearing this, mm-hmm. you are awesome. 
Give us a call again. You can call 1-833-STDWITK. Right now, leave us a message, any suggestions, even on the format of the show. Just tell us. Tell us what you want us to do. We're listening. Get weird with it. <laughs> uh, and also, speaking of the phones, a uh, shout out to our formerly anonymous caller, Stephen B., who hipped us to Canada's Shag Harbor incident as an episode. Thanks so much for tuning in, Stephen. Uh, Stephen reached out reached out to us, and I hope you don't get mad at us for saying this, Stephen, but he, he said, guys, I don't know why I didn't say my name, but I'm the one who called about Shag Harbor incident. So <laughs> there you go. It's, we, I, I especially get it. It's tough when you're, when you're working live and you only got three minutes. But call us. Try it for yourself. Don't take my word or Stephen's word for it. Today, we're off to England, and as they say in Staffordshire— those of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. What the heck are we talking about? We'll tell you. Uh, journey with us. And if you are a listener on the other side of the Atlantic, if you are located in Europe, if you are located in the United Kingdom, if you are located in Staffordshire or if you've ever been there, we want to hear from you. Here's, here's the thing about Staffordshire. It's a county in the West Midlands of England. It's landlocked, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. not one of the coastal areas. It has a pretty healthy population of just over 1 million people. And like most places in the United Kingdom, it's home to a storied past, numerous historical buildings, monuments, and so on. You know that thing that you, you probably hear thrown around all the time uh, in Europe, 200 miles is a long way and in the U.S., 200 years is a long time. Yes. Yeah. So this, this place does have a lot of history. However, most people outside of the United Kingdom and Europe haven't really heard of the place unless that is they're into the world of fringe research and conspiracies. That's right. Yeah, Staffordshire is actually a little bit famous in those realms because there's this tiny little thing relatively to the rest of Staffordshire, tiny, tiny little thing. It's a monument called the Shepherd's Monument. And on this monument, there's an engraving. It's got one of the most enigmatic, as of yet, unbroken ciphers mm. that you heard us say, or at least phonetically attempt to say <laughs> earlier. Osvav. <laughs> Are <laughs> you backwards masking you guys? <laughs> that's what, that's what we're going to uh, talk progressively in backwards masking. Yes. In this like episode. Like yeah. It. it was Paul's idea. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's true. We are phonetically pronouncing this very weird cipher. It's literally eight characters mm -hmm. and then two more little characters and an exclamation mark. No, no, I, I, that's just <laughs> I know, in there for I know, the effect. I know, I know. You know, it made me think of, um, <laughs> do you guys, you know, I don't, have time to play a lot of video games, but I'm in this somewhat monogamous video game relationship with a thing called Skyrim. And Still? I went back and started playing it again. Wow. I'm different now. I'm an Argonian. They're the lizard people. I was a lizard Ooh. people. You were? I was. Yeah, were you, yeah. A, were you a mage? I know you love mages. I was a mage. I was an Argonian mage. Nice. Oh, messed up. You should have been a thief. Why? I don't know. You Argonians just, are awesome. With the, that's they have a, a lot stereotype. Of attributes. That's a stereotype. <laughs> they have a lot of good attributes for it. So I'm saying, oh god, that sounds awful, but it's so true because you <laughs> you literally pick your like species or your race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a great game, and you can go back and you can do all the stuff you want to do. Uh, anyway, anyway, it reminds me of the dragon shouts where they're all you know. It's got really dope music in that game, and they're like Dovahkiin. Dover King. That's right. You know. Oh, he, dude, it totally oh, does. Oh, 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 <laughs> exactly. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's intense stuff, you know. Uh, but anyhow, this weird Dover King esque code uh, came to be sometime between, well, the monument came to be sometime between 1748 and 1763 when this British Parliament member named Thomas Anson commissioned a monument to be built at a place called Shugborough Hall in Staffordshire. And we may be mispronouncing that. We talked a little bit about that before we went on the air. Shugborough. 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 And no, you said it feels like an Australian? It does. Kind of? Kind of? Yeah. yeah. Shugborough. Shugborough. It does a little bit. I think, yeah. I, think. I don't know why. Uh, it's not. <laughs> shug. Just the word yeah. shug, you know? Feels yeah. Australian. It seems like a, the name of some kind of Australian implement, mm -hmm. you know? A shug. 
Dear, dear Aussies, uh, I don't know what that would be. Yeah, I don't know. I know. It's Shug. like a shiv, but it's more blunt. You yeah. know, I'm so into Australian slang. Calling McDonald's Maccas has like just it, it's changed my world. They say that. Yeah, M A C C A. Nice. I don't know if it'll actually get me to go to a McDonald's, but I like to drive by and say Maccas. I feel like a shug would be some kind of club. You know, mm-hmm. It's not like a club where you'd party, like a club you'd like a cudgel. club someone with. Yeah. Yeah. Man. So this this place, Sugarborough Hall in Staffordshire, uh, is the location of this monument. And Thomas Anson, although he commissions this monument, the Shepherd's Monument, his brother George, who is an admiral, actually pays for it. And a Flemish sculptor named Peter Shemakers, with two E's, is the guy who actually builds the thing. But what does it look like? Well, uh, the sculpture is comprised of a mirror image or what's known as a boss relief of a painting by Nicolas Poussin that's called The Shepherds of Arcadia. And uh, it's also known as – okay, I'm going to give this a whirl. Um, I think this is Latin, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Et in Arcadia ego, les burgers de Arcadi or – the Arcadian Shepherds, and it was painted in 1637 uh, or between 1637 to 1638. Mm-hmm. And it's it's this it's this fascinating iconic work. You can it's more than worth your time to check it out. And I think some of us listening will be familiar yeah. with this painting and know where this is going because right? it's shepherds that are around a tomb, right? Mm-hmm. And then they have very specific hand gestures that they're doing, and mm-hmm. it's it, check it out. So there are four figures in the in the painting. There are three shepherds. There is a female figure gathered around this tomb, as you said, Matt. And two of the shepherds are pointing at the tomb in a, in a real sketchy way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and on this tomb, there's this Latin text, et in Arcadia ego, which translates to I am even in Arcadia or I am also in Arcadia. You'll hear other versions with like, uh, even in Arcadia, am I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever. It's Latin. Uh, it, it's really, it's a really cool phrase, very famous phrase in literature. Uh, but let's let's bracket that. Just know that that exists right now, and let's let's go back to this sculpture, this bas relief. It looks like the painting, but it's got some key differences. Now, the first big thing you'll notice if you're looking at the the monument, the Shugborough monument, is that there is an extra sarcophagus that's sitting on top of a tomb inside the original painting, which you go, okay. I wonder what that could mean, an extra tomb. Maybe there are two people entombed that we need to be thinking about in this. Who knows? It could be more cryptic than that. Let's move on. Because the other thing is that there are two stone heads above the image from the painting. Okay, so you got one that's uh, <laughs> this mirthful, uh, a mirthful fellow. Uh, the look on his face is the way to tell the mirth. <laughs> that's how he yes. laughs. Yeah. Uh, the other, though is horned and bearing a marked uh, resemblance to that old Greek god Pan that you might remember. That old goat. That, the, literally the old goat <laughs> Pan uh, that is both fun and, and like uh, whimsical but also extremely creepy. Yeah. It yeah. has some, some uh, representations, uh, some, some symbolical representations of other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the goat being uh, – one of them you might remember from other things we've talked about on the show mm-hmm. with the uh, the old Baphomet. Ah, that's right. Yes, yes. And while the sculpture itself is impressive, most people are are, are kind of over the sculpture. Yeah, they're more fascinated by this inscription carved below it. At first glance, it seems simple. It's as you said, Ben. It's a scant two lines of text. That's yep. it. And it, it looks very confusing. It looks like the worst Wheel of Fortune clue ever. I'm going to do a version of your Skyrim of how I would do it oh if it was God, a please. chance. Yeah. Usvav! Wow. That was great. <laughs> wow. Was that, did that blow out Shut. like crazy? <laughs> I tried. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> well, we, got, we got protections against that, against the dark arts. Uh, I would do it more as like, Usvav! <laughs> That's great. Because okay. the double V at the end gives you a yeah. Sounds, you know? mm. yeah. Uh, maybe. But how do you how do you add in the D and the M though? So, That's a separate line. Yeah. 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 So this is that's the top line O U O S V A V V, and 
it's encapsulated or bookended by these letters at the bottom line. So if you look at the sec- at the second line, the line below O U O S V A V V, there is a letter D below and to the left of the first O. If you're looking at it, if you're looking straight at it, and there's an M below and to the right of the last V. So when you put it all together, that's what it looks like. It looks like that that agglomeration of vowels and Vs yeah. and one S, and then below it, there's the D and the M. Uh, and we keep adding the exclamation mark just because it feels like something you should shout. Uh, but appearing simple is not the same thing as being simple, right? Yeah, exactly. Because a lot of people have been trying to figure out since this thing was put up, what exactly it means. And nobody has, let's say, sufficiently come up with an answer. Mm -hmm. But again, even if you think you completely got the answer, there's a matter of proving it because who's going to prove it to you? Anyway, we'll get into that right now because let's go through some of the people who've actually attempted. Several Charles in here. It's very Charles heavy. Charles Dickens, uh, we may be familiar with some of his work. Uh, he wrote a ton of things that are popular in Western canon, and he was defeated by this series <laughs> of letters. He tried and he failed. Then we have uh, another uh, important British Charles, uh, also with a D for a last name, Darwin, mm-hmm. who apparently ate every animal that he documented. <laughs> True story. Oh, he's, uh, was, that was him, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Wait. You, you're telling me he was out there in the Galapagos and he was just going to town? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess when you're in the Galapagos, well, he, eat he, all the animals. He apparently had a history. He was in some kind of club of exotic meats well, at, at Cambridge mm-hmm. or whatever where he would eat like albatrosses and mm-hmm. egrets and weird, you know, stringy, gamey meats. And he, he kept – he carried that spirit right into his uh, research. That he, is like one yeah. of the most elite – clubs I've ever heard of. He called – he apparently defended – we learned this from Jack O'Brien. Apparently uh-huh. he defended uh, – he defended this practice by saying it was for science, but he ate like 20 tortoises or something? Was yeah, to it? the point where I think he threatened their very existence <laughs> on said Jeez. island. Because he's thought of as this like great conservationist. But that really was not his bag at all. He was more just a scientist, researcher, documenter and a devourer. Mm-hmm. There we go. Charles but Dollar. Dollar. yet – he he mastered the tortoise. He discovered the secret of evolution, and yet he could not surmount these letters. Mm-hmm. Wow. Neither could a man named Josiah Wedgwood. He was one of the godfathers of industrialization. And, oh, man, he, he got out all the steamworks. He, like, figured out, okay, we're going to do this whole thing. We're going uh, <laughs> to get an assembly line and figure out how to do this. And guess what? Nope. No, he couldn't, even though he uh, industrialized the manufacture of, of pottery, <laughs> yeah. which, you know, that's important. It sounds it, it sounds weird now, but the, it, it was – take our word for it. He was a big deal, uh, maybe a, a subject for a different episode. But here we are. It's 2019, and those old Anson bros are long since gone to dust and death. The, the guys who actually made the thing. Yeah. Well, the guys who commissioned it. The, well, yes. OK, yeah. you're right. But the ones who commission are generally the ones who have the meaning, right? Because yeah. the person who sculpted it and mm-hmm. uh, chiseled it just knew, oh, that goes there. Yeah, got his marching orders. Good call. So here we are. And people, everyone still wonders what on earth this code could mean. And just as importantly, everyone is still wondering whether someone – has finally solved it. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. And I just have to say, uh, Paul Paul was trying to get us to go to ad break for like 10 minutes there. (laughs) And it was so much fun to to watch Paul and continually nod to him. Like, oh, yes, of course. But when I could see where exactly we were going, oh, Toying with you, Paul, is one of my greatest excitements. <laughs> Here's where it gets crazy. Ooh. So over the past few centuries, uh, numerous people have made varying claims about this inscription. That includes conjecture about the intent, any, some kind of explanation or origin story, and most importantly, uh, the meaning. So let's look at the theories uh, in no particular order. 
Some are a little out there. Some may seem more mundane, but we want to see which ones sound the most reasonable to you. So there's an author named Dave Ramsden. In a 2014 book, he references manuscript evidence from the local record office, and he says that based on what he found, Thomas Anson's peers thought the monument was a funereal structure and that was dedicated to some figure known just as the shepherdess. So from his take, that DM stands for dismanibus, and the eight-letter inscription is a cipher concealing the name of the person being memorialized. So in his book, he he walks through a, a pretty thorough decryption effort, and he argues that through the use of a polyalphabetic cipher, he has found that the name, the name they're referring to is Magdalene. Dude. By the way, the dismanibus uh, that you heard us talking about, it, it's in reference to Roman um, spirits, like or go, not ghosts, but spirits of people who have died. Uh, it's kind of really interesting because it has actually uh, further back – or it has pagan roots as well. So it's just an interesting thing in mm. when you connect it up with uh, what Ben is just talking about there. Uh, I don't know. But what's the difference between a spirit and a ghost, Matt? Well, isn't it the same thing? But like a ghost is trapped and caught behind, right? Ah, uh, yes. They, can, that, they cannot pass is, over. That is the distinction, I believe. Maybe. Yeah. I, I like that. I sure. stand behind that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And also, but having that name Magdalene, I mean, come on, we all know what that might be referring to, right? Old Mary, Mary Magdalene. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes, the plot thickens. But that's not the only thing. Just spoiler alert, uh, people disagree with this author. In another book called Anson's Gold, a fellow named George Edmund says that we have to remember George Anson was a naval man. He was an admiral. And George Edmund argues that Anson created this cipher to hide the latitude and longitude of an island uh, where he had buried or discovered a huge Spanish treasure. Oh, it's a treasure map. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that he mounted a secret expedition in the 18th century to recover this treasure, which was located... Uh, but due to unforeseen circumstances, left where it was found. Oh, man. Do you think it's in that one that one giant hole? You know the one I'm talking about? Oak Island? Yeah. Some Oak Island? You think it's Oak Island? <laughs> oh, man. Do you think they're really finding stuff at Oak Island, or do you think that the production team is slipping Throwing in stuff into the hole? <laughs> feathers and ro I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I had heard that, but I don't have a ton of experience I've never been there, so. It would certainly make for a good TV to have things discovered. <laughs> That's all I would say. Good point. Good point. So the idea here is that letters in code were sent back to Lord Anson by the expedition leader uh, and that these validate and include part of the cipher and that this proves what the cipher is for. So George Edmund isn't necessarily saying that the cipher is solved, but he's saying that's the right direction to look into. And then we have a returning school of thought from a previous episode. In 1982, the authors of a book called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail uh, speculated that the painter you had mentioned earlier, Noel, uh, Poussin was a member of what's called the Priory of Sion oh. with an S. Yeah, and we remember we interviewed – uh, the the daughter of one of the authors. Agent mm -hmm. was her last name, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great interview. Uh, fascinating story. Um, but the, and the whole idea here, right, is that perhaps the shepherds of Arcadia that are in this monument are actually pointing to something very specific, not uh, necessarily anything to do with the tomb, mm -hmm. but where to find the Holy Grail. Dun, dun. Du, 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 du. And then uh, there's this whole other thing where uh, as part of the promotion of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, they had these experts or they're, I guess they're formerly code breakers. Uh, 
mm-hmm. right? Who came through and they tried to to figure out what the heck this thing is. Um, and they they specifically were looking at this connection here with the Priory of Sion connection with uh, the shepherds pointing to the Holy Grail. And we got a little more on that. So it's uh, Sheila and Oliver Lawn, two of the people involved here. They propose that the letters actually encode a specific phrase, a phrase, Jesus H. Defy, D-E-F-Y. Spelled like the phi, right? Yeah. Uh, where the H supposedly stands for Christos, um, and this is a, a Greek word meaning Messiah. And the reference is to a Jesus bloodline or uh, the bloodline of Jesus, mm-hmm. H. Christ. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I honestly don't know what that comes from, Jesus, H. Christ. What, what is that? Do we know? Always, somebody, somebody, call us. <laughs> right, right. <Okay. clears throat> uh, yeah, it's it's this idea, right? That that uh, Jesus Christ, the historical Jesus Christ, did actually have uh, children. Yes, or issue as they would be called. And you know, this is very Dan Brown. Dan Brown leans very heavily on this in uh, one of his books, at least in the Da Vinci Code. And the idea is that this bloodline was uh, secreted away. And you'll read about it being secreted away in different parts of the world, often France. Um, so that that idea is really interesting because uh, these code breakers, uh, Sheila Lawn and Oliver Lawn, are no joke. They are the legit, true blue, real deal. Yes. They were working on Enigma in World War II. So they're not just they're not just some couple who happened by, you know yeah. what I mean? They're breaking Nazi codes and then they think that that's what happened, right? Or that's they think that that's what the meaning could be. Right, and Sheila Lawn said that she believes it may also be kind of a love letter of some sort. Yeah. Well, and the other thing you have to remember here is that they're having ideas uh put out there for them to look for in a way. You know, with the way it was shaped with the promotion for the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail and for what it could mean. You just uh, just keep that in mind. You're the little skeptic part of the back of your mind that they're being led a little bit. So already this is this is getting weird, right? Yeah. We've got, uh, we've got someone saying it's the – one of the key clues to the secret story of Jesus Christ – We've got someone else saying it's buried treasure, and we've got someone else saying that uh, Anson was in love, perhaps, with someone and needed, for some reason, to keep their identity a secret. Hmm. Yeah. So how does this shake out in the modern day? Yeah, uh, most of the modern theories approach this from sort of a a acrostic kind of perspective or like, you know, think about any kind of word – Patterned, patterned word art, I guess, where various letters line up, almost like a crossword puzzle, but an acrostic yeah. is a specific uh, form of this, meaning they interpret each letter um, as the initial letter of a larger word. So like M-A-T-T, for example, not to pick on you, like make, uh, make Alice take Tylenol or whatever. Absolutely. So sort of like a mnemonic device of like mm-hmm. the way to remember something. Or it's – they're also very popular in like presentations or kind of like self-help, touchy-feely kind uh-huh. of, you know, office uh, PowerPoints, you know, uh-huh. about things like synergy and, you know, thing, you know, S would stand for super cool and E. Would, anyway, yeah. it's not good. I love that. I'm fond of making up those they're, kind of things. They're fun when you make them absurd on purpose. But like as an actual motivational device, it sort of elicits an instant eye roll because it's sort of like a cliche, right? You know what I mean? Right, but it's it's just a fun mental exercise. Oh. It is tough to take it seriously, though. Well, it's also tough to do it well, and that's the joke too, right? Is yeah. a lot of times they end up people run out of ideas and they just kind of become either redundant or just absurd. If you're ever in a knife fight, remember to stop. That stands for stab two other people. There you go. Oh. <laughs> very, very good. Very, very helpful. Um, but yeah, so uh, in 1951, um, Morchard Bishop uh, or Morchard, I'm, I'm going to go with the hard CH, uh, speculated that the letters might be an initialism for the Latin phrase optime uxoris optime, sororis vidus amantissimus. I want to sing this in like a choir. Mm. Sorosis vidus amantissimus vovit virtuibus. That was great. But the big question is, what does that mean for those of us who don't speak Latin? 
Best of wives, best of sisters, a most devoted widower dedicates, parentheses, this to your virtues. Oh, that's nice. See, now that's really, really nice. Uh, so that's that's specifically about George Anson, right? And that would mean, if this is correct, that those eight letters are actually just a coded dedication to his wife after she passed away. Which is interesting because why would you have to put that in code? Well, it's I think it's less of in code and more of fitting it on – the oh, monument, perhaps, right? Okay. And this, this yeah. would be my mm-hmm. opinion. Mm-hmm. His his spouse, by the way, Lady Elizabeth York, daughter of Philip York, first Earl of Hardwick. Uh, they they did not have any children, but uh, I could see that if it's just um, a person whose spouse died and had the means to give some kind of dedication mm-hmm. to her that only maybe even had meaning to him. Uh, Maybe okay. Maybe, maybe that's there. That's maybe up it's there a for private me. thing. Yeah, I just I, I like it, it. To me, on surface, it seems it seems very strange and a little bit chuckle worthy that this guy would say, "All right, I really love my wife, uh, and I think all these wonderful, nice things about her, but no one can know." Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, Guys, I love my wife. Everyone, keep it a secret. The other, <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anyone. This, the other thing that you could mm-hmm. say here, just before we move on, is that maybe it was a backhanded thing or like a, a cruel joke in uh, in her memory, because maybe she wasn't a, a devoted. Maybe she wasn't the best of wives and sisters and devoted. Uh, oh wow! Is like maybe? said with an eye roll, yeah. kind of, yeah. or a little tongue in the cheek. Yeah. This is before that uh, forward slash s. Yeah, that could stand for sarcasm. Uh, yeah, and what? I need to be. I need to use that. But see, but yeah. that way, only he knows that he's being a dick to his wife. <laughs> oh, good, <laughs> good. Oh, uh, this is this is terrible. I hope that's not the case. Uh, other people don't think it is, though. There's a guy named Steve Regimball who interprets the letters as standing for a new Latin translation of the following phrase: "Vanity, oh vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity." Oh, Ecclesiastes. Mm-hmm. Ecclesiastes 12.8, uh, he speculates that this, this phrase, orator ut omnia sunt vanitas ait vanitas vanitatum, would – I feel like I just cast a spell. Yep. <laughs> he, he thinks it may be the source of an earlier inscription, omnia vanitas, which might have been carved on an alcove at the estate by one of Thomas Anson's pals, George Littleton. Interesting. They, okay. Keep an eye on that maybe though. That might yeah. and that maybe. I, again, this one, this is one of the ones that, um, yeah, I guess I just don't, I need to know more about that because I, vanity of vanities saith the preacher, all is vanity. All is vanity. Well, that's true. All worldly things and actions are vanity. It's, it's just like carving a giant monument mm-hmm. for anything. Yeah, that, well, yeah. Well, you know what this reminds me of? Reminds me of the Georgia Guidestones. <gasps> mm-hmm. That whole idea of like give a little thought to what's important. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's sort of like – but at least the Georgia Guidestones' intent was to be understood. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, right. You know, it's not really very cool if you have like a message for the world and no mm-hmm. one can understand it or if they're just wildly speculating about what it means. That's a good point. So it may be a personal thing. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Of personal significance to the Anson brothers if they are indeed the people who inscribed this. Uh, the NSA also got involved. So of we had course they did. U.S. intelligence in there, a guy named Keith Massey in modern times. You, you'll read some press about him claiming to have solved the letters. He interprets them as an initialism for the Latin phrase, oro ut omnes sequantur viam ad verum vitam. I pray that all may follow the way to true life. Is this uh, biblical again? Yeah, yeah, Johnny 416, John. John. 
<laughs> yeah, that's really good. Uh, reference to that verse uh, reading, John four sixteen reading, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Ego sum via et veritas et vita. Right? That, that, and that's the one that uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin had uh, printed on the back of his uh, sleeveless leather jacket. I John never 14, got that. 6? No, I was. <laughs> three sixteen. Three sixteen. That's so, the one. That's was, the go-to. <laughs> that's the go-to? Yeah. As a child, I never understood that. Oh, I have way too many of those rattling around in my brain that I could probably I, – well, I'm not even going to. Verses or wrestler just, trivia? Just verses and wrestler trivia. <laughs> but they kind of conflated they, yeah, together over time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought The Undertaker was the coolest, but that's very on brand for me. Sting, man. 316 is just for God so loved the world. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. That's a very nice message that Stone Cold has on his – that's, that's very counter to his <laughs> rough and tumble <laughs> Stone Cold image. You know? For God so, so loved the world that he made me. <laughs> and then I – what does he do? He, he does the, the Stone stunner? Cold stunner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Stun yeah. y'all. It reminds me of like Jules in Pulp Fiction doing that biblical verse. Only that one gets scary though. That one gets – I will strike down upon thee and all that. Mm-hmm. You would think anyway. But which wasn't an actual Bible verse. Are you kidding? No. It's what? Not. No. No. Really? Sorry, this whole man. time, man. Sorry. Dang. It's an interpretation. Let's put it that way. And maybe it's just vanity. Maybe it all is vanity. But these are just some of the most popular concepts. Now it's time to ask whether any of this checks out. And we'll do just that after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. And Matt, you just wrecked my childhood. That Tarantino uh, line isn't from the Bible. It's a much more elaborated version. The yeah. real verse is actually just, and I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. So obviously. Yeah. Well, but, that's one translation. There are so many different ones. Yeah. But, but Vulgate you know. versions and whatnot. I like the word rebuke. Let's bring rebuke back. Yeah. I want to rebuke some stuff. Isn't that just when you like call someone out, you take them to task? It's sort of like a rebuttal, but it's a little stronger. It's a little – it's like it, it implies shaming of some sort of yeah. like finger wagging, right? It criticizing someone. Yeah. So it's it's not quite rejecting. It's kind of admonishing but in a very strong way, kind of like yeah. how contempt is worse than dislike. It's a really good white instant uh, for pretty low mana cost, just so you know. <laughs> You have made so many people's day with just that sentence. <laughs> I don't think I understand the reference. It's the MTG, Magic the Gathering. Ah, yes. Yes, of all, course. All anytime, of you say, anytime you say something that I don't understand, I should always assume that it's magic. Uh, even when you say MTG, I have to be like, Madison Square Garden? Madison no, no. Oh, we're making an acrostic. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, move them giblets? I don't know. Yep, yep. I'm, I'm working live here. But move, literally, yeah. uh-huh, all of my vocabulary comes from middle school Magic the Gathering play. We should get together and play uh, play magic at, at some point. I have to learn yeah. first. All of us? Yeah. yeah. Everyone? Like even even you, the listener? Well, yeah. Yeah. Come hang out. Let's play. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll sneak everyone in. Let's, I think it's yeah. more fun if we feel like it's a heist. We'll do That's an MTG right. meetup. MTG conspiracy meetup. <laughs> Sounds epic. Yeah. Meet the group, MTG. <gasps> Or the gang, or the guys. I like the gang now, but it's not an acro- acrostic and an acronym aren't the same thing, right? I mean, they're sort they're of not. They're, yeah. they're they're kind of no, because doesn't the, the the down word has to be a word in and of itself, oh. right? So MTG, even if it's spelled MTG in Magic the Gathering, it's not an acrostic because MTG is meaningless without it, it representing something. Yeah, right? an acronym would be the abbreviation made out of the first letters of the words. So our MTG thing is an acronym, but an acrostic would be. Uh, some kind of poem or form of writing like you described where the first letter or syllable or word of each line spells out a word. Ah. Uh, So we've got to ask ourselves, does any of this stuff check out? Uh, Not our our plans to invite everyone (laughs) to play Magic the Gathering with us uh, and have Matt roundly kick – kick the snot out of all of us. I'd go easy. Very good at that game. You are lying – I, you're one of my favorite people, but I can tell when you're lying. Oh. <laughs> no, Matt Matt is really, really good at this. Uh, so not talking about that stuff, but talking about this concept, uh, the one that I think really stuck out to us and, and to a lot of us listening now is the idea of this priory of Scion. 
This, I, I think yeah. this is definitely where the the mystery heightens, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is this is a wild one. So this is a fringe, I guess, secret society. Maybe a fraternal order is a good way to describe it. It was uh, founded. You know, the official story is it was founded and then dissolved in 1956 by a guy named Pierre Plantard as part of a hoax. But people who buy into the idea think it dates back much, much further, you know, back to, of course, the time of the living historical Jesus Christ. This was considered – this was not taken very well or very seriously by a lot of people in the academy with a capital A. Uh, But the, the concept existed for a long time. Some people saying it was a hoax and some people taking it very seriously and some people even claiming to be members of the Priory of Sion. And then boom, it went mainstream when Dan Brown leveraged this concept for the basis of the Da Vinci Code, which is um, – I, I still think a solid solid film and I enjoyed the book. Uh, I would say I have not read the book. But mm. the film, I was happier than a lot of the critics about it. You enjoyed it. Yeah. Did you see the subsequent film, The Inferno? Angels and Demons and Infernos and – I did not see was that. Was there a third one that was in Inferno? Inferno is the third one. There's yeah, Angels one. and Demons is the Ooh. second. Were those – Is that those, correct did, did or those, am I – did, did I get those that do wrong? Well? Did those do well? I mean they made three of them. They must have done relatively well. Sure, yeah. They had to coast off the blockbuster status. Expensive. Oh, Yeah. I, that, okay, so Paul, just off mic or in our ears, and, and alas, you will <laughs> yeah. never hear the voice of Paul because if you did, it would melt your insides, it would. much like hearing the voice of the Archangel Gabriel or something like uh-huh. that. Um, but yeah, he says Inferno was apparently quite bad. Oh. Um, I haven't seen any of them, but mm-hmm. the reason I asked did they do well is because I just don't really have much of a memory of them existing. I just remember the lure of – The Lyov? Yeah, the lure of – You guys are great at French. <laughs> I'm not even going to try it. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So this also – this book, by the way, The Da Vinci Code, just to be fair, uh, we should say that he did receive criticism from other authors and people familiar with the theory because, uh, you know, the authors of Holy Blood and Holy Grail uh, felt to a large degree that he plagiarized their work. Yeah. And that he was essentially using their research to sell a novel. So that – that's the moment though. That is the moment where this stuff hit the zeitgeist. And the idea here is that the Anson brothers were both members of the Priory of Sion and the original painter of the Arcadian Shepherd painting was also a member of the Priory of Sion and that the Holy Grail is not really a cup, a goblet you know, the – the um, what's the Indiana Jones line? The, the cup of a carpenter. Yeah. It's yours, Indy. Yours and My mine. My face is melting. My <laughs> face is melting. He chose poorly. He, cho- <laughs> <laughs> he also should have moisturized. Well, OK. So but it, <laughs> if it's not that cup that mm-hmm. has dastardly powers, what is it? It's a symbol. It's a code phrase. It's describing the – physical descendants of Jesus Christ. If this were true, if this were proven, this would be one of the most significant moments in human history. And we found a provable living descendant of the historical figure known as Jesus Christ. So if that's such an amazing thing, why hide it? Because it would upend everything, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for... Most of the last 2,000 years, the idea of Jesus Christ having children at all was very heretical and the Catholic Church worked arduously to control its um, its message and any splinter groups or dissident schools of thought were brutally suppressed, murdered wholesale. You know what I mean? Uh, ironically, of course, this is exactly what happened to the first Christians, the predecessors of the Catholics. New ideas – banish the and also torture. Well, it's, you know, when you think about it, they wanted to control a message because they didn't have – the cost of communication is so high that when people are in isolation, you know, like on an island off the coast of France or somewhere in North Africa, they can begin to make their own saints, for instance. That's a huge thing even now, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> Dude, uh, the more we look at it, it seems, in or at least in my opinion right now, the brutality of the control mechanisms throughout history do seem eerily necessary in a lot of ways. And that scares me a little bit. It's a real politic yeah. kind of move. But – but this, this is the idea. So it would make sense then for this to be kept a secret because um, the idea is that the Catholic Church doesn't want this truth to get out. Yeah. And we know that – while we don't know for sure whether this is true or whether it's all you know speculation, bluff and bluster, uh, we do know that the Catholic Church has in the past uh, run very, very – large and ambitious information control campaigns, like for centuries. But is this too weird? It might be too weird for some of us. Uh, there's another mundane theory that came from The Telegraph. I love this. I like this one too. This is interesting. Lay it on us. <laughs> well, I guess if this is what it is, then it makes so many other things hilarious that have happened with the NSA getting involved and other high-profile people trying to solve this thing when in actuality perhaps it's just some uh, some graffiti left left by people who lived in the, the house or the estate uh, after the money was put there. So, OK. So this, this historian A.J. Morton mm -hmm. and he thinks that the inscription is just, was put there uh, in the 19th century – by residents George Adams and his wife, Mary Vernon Venables. I love that last name. Vernon Venables. Now, what were the two bottom letters? D and M. D and M. Hmm. All right. In my head, I was, I was for some reason connecting G or making it G and M for a moment there, thinking George and Mary. Mm -hmm. But no, that doesn't make sense. But Vernon Venables, that's two Vs. That's at least two of them, and there are a lot of those. So Morton, who is an expert in graves and monuments, uh, he said that the letters can be matched to this couple, Adams and Vernon Venables, uh, because they were relations of Thomas Anson and there doesn't appear to be any reference to the curious letters until the 19th century. To Morton, this suggests that they were added later. Nothing in Thomas Anson's life fits the letters in the inscription except the family of his nephew, George Adams. So the idea is that regardless of all our speculation and these concepts of conspiracy spanning centuries, someone just did some graffiti, which is also – it, it always reminds me of that story about the runic inscriptions in the Hagia Sophia. Did we talk about this on air? I don't know that we have. Maybe as a casual mention. So, so there's this, there's this thing in the Hagia Sophia that used to blow people's minds. It is a runic description called the Halfdan inscription. It was discovered in 1964, and for a while. People, you know, not naturally being prone to reading runes, uh, for a while people thought, whoa, this is amazing. Vikings get all the way down here and, and the history is hidden and it goes so much deeper than found. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when they translated it, uh, when they translated it and they still couldn't read all of it, it turned out that it said like, half Dan carved these runes. So it's the historical equivalent of, you know, Paul was here. So, <laughs> so, a lot so of, funny. A lot of graffiti happens. This, this answer might not satisfy a lot of us, but any way you look at it, the truth is this. At this point, no one really agrees on what this inscription means. We've outlined some of the main theories – and each of these theories have their proponents. Some of us listening now have probably found one that particularly calls to us. And I, and I will say the, the theory of a priory of Sion is a fascinating read. Uh, we just don't know if it is connected to this inscription. But residents of Staffordshire encounter new theories continually, like all the time. Yeah. We have a quote here that says, we get five or six people a week who believe they have solved the code, so we're a bit wary of them now. It's great That's accent. just an exhausted Stratford Shiren, Shirean, Sh Strat Stratford Shire. Wouldn't it be Sheer? Stratford Sheer? Well, it's Lancashire. Lancashire. It's Ed Sheeran. Lancashire. It's right. I've always heard Lancashire. Uh, well, if you want, if the Beatles, the day in the life of is to be uh, believed, it's 
uh, 10,000 holes in L- Blackford, Lancashire. Yeah, but they were just trying to make it fit the, the song. It didn't. wasn't a rhyme scheme. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our classic episode for this evening. We can't wait to hear your thoughts. We try to be easy to find online. Find us at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on Facebook, X, and YouTube. On Instagram and TikTok, we're Conspiracy Stuff Show. Call our number. It's 1-833-STDWYTK. Leave a voicemail. And if you have more to say, we can't wait to hear from you at our good old-fashioned email address, where we are, conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.